welcome to Revolutionary Health, the show that focuses on Black gay men's health and wellness. I'm your host, Michael Ward. Here joining me today, I have an amazing panel of doctors that are coming back. We've got Dr. Mel Branch, Dr. Leo, Dr. Q. But before we get into that, make sure that you like, subscribe, follow, comment, tell a friend to tell a friend, and most importantly, follow us on all our social media, Facebook, at The Counter Narrative, Instagram as well. On Twitter, we're at Building Desire here. So I just want to allow these three beautiful gentlemen to introduce themselves before we get into this topic about medical mistrust and medical distrust, because there's a difference, as I'm learning as well, too. So I hope you take something away from this. I'm here. So I will kick it off with you all introducing yourselves. But Dr. Mel Branch, I will let you start so you can let the people know. I actually wanted to start with you, Michael Ward, and I wanted oh. to check where your spirit is today because you're the host with the most. So hey. I want to see where your spirit is today. Let's go. <laughs> My spirit today, I appreciate it. Kick it back to me. My spirit today is running um, running around. I had a dentist appointment yesterday, which is going to be um, an experience, but it was my first female, black female doctor um, ever in my life. I just realized that as I was actually going, she's an oral surgeon. Um, and so I have to get a tooth extracted, um, my bottom left tooth. So I'm a little nervous about it. Um, it's been giving me a lot of worry. Um, but I have the procedure in two weeks. So that's kind of been running through my mind and my spirit amidst everything with COVID. I was really, really nervous, um, even going into the dentist office. So some of the procedures that they have before going in is I had to wear a mask. I had to call. They only let, uh, like two or three people in at a time. I had to get my temperature mm -hmm. checked. They had me, um, fill, uh, they, they asked me COVID questions at the receptionist desk. I had to fill out a COVID questionnaire. Then I had to fill out another one for the oral surgeon. Then they had to take me back. I had to have my mask on. I had to wash my hands before I got in there. I had to rinse with hydrogen peroxide. Um, I was like, oh my God, my appointment is at one o'clock. Ma'am, it's 1.45. And by the time that I got all of that done, but there were very, very good procedures in place to kind of put me at ease with it. Um, but even the experience of like, uh, like I said, my first a female black doctor in a dentist's office. And she just came in and she explained everything. She asked me if I had any questions. She could tell that I was confused as hell when she was telling me about uh, taking my tooth out and everything like that. But she really, she really broke it down. And one of the beautiful things that, and thank you for asking me this question because now it's all coming back to me. <laughs> but one of the beautiful things that she asked me was she was just saying like, I know that my job is to take your tooth out, but I just want to make sure that you've considered all of your options before we go to that step. So before you go ahead and do this, I just want to make sure that you've already talked to the doctor. You've already talked to the other doctor that came in. She said, I'm going to check your tooth. Um, make sure, you know, this is going to be the right decision that you want to go ahead and do. Because I was like, let's just get it over with. Um, but she really broke it down and explained it to me. And when I was confused, she put it in really layman's terms. Um, that really kind of put me at ease before they hit me with the dollar figures, you know, anything with a comma in it. I was just kind of like, girl, um, <laughs> what, <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, really? Can y'all like go back in here and save the two? So that's really kind of been like giving me a little bit of worry and anxiety. But I think that ties perfectly into our topic because I really was like, I just, I already don't have a good experience with the dentist's office. Right. It's not my favorite place to be. I know oral health is very important as well um, to us, but that is where I am. I'm I actually in two, before we get into the show, I actually have my first time in a COVID restaurant. So my anxiety is, uh, is still a little bit high, um, but I'm, I'm in pretty good spirits. So thank you for asking that question. I appreciate it so much before we got started. So Thank you. How are you? And no, where are you I, at I, in the world? Yeah, I appreciate <laughs> you breaking that down. I'm, I'm doing okay. You know, been busy this past week. Um, and everybody, I'm David Malbranch, internal medicine doc, uh, sexual health doc, activist, writer, big mouth, that kind of stuff. Um, on, but I, I, I'm, overall, I'm doing okay. So uh, we're not going to go there as a black gay show. Um, so I, I just want to say that everyone is doing well. And I think we're, we're recording this on Father's Day weekend. So it's a day after Juneteenth. And so uh, recognizing Juneteenth and all the kind of post uh, George Floyd stuff that's going on with Juneteenth and then also wishing everybody, all the fathers, mentors, 
um, uncles, stepfathers, father figures out there. Happy Father's Day uh, for tomorrow. But I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Dr. Q, how are you? I'm well, thanks for asking. <laughs> so I'm Dr. Clinton Robinson, I'm an infectious disease doctor here in Atlanta. Um, honestly, not much going on. Our office slowly started a soft reopening with rotating schedules. So last week was my first week back in the office seeing patients face to face as opposed to a computer screen. So I was kind of excited about that. But now I'm going to the week where I sit at home for 10 hours a day on the computer. So <laughs> <laughs> nice. A little bit change of pace of things for you. Yes. So before I get into Dr. Leo, so I just want to ask you as well, with the experience that I had as far as the COVID question is, is that something that you have your patients do as well? Before they oh, yeah. Well, what we do actually, um, patients get screened and get a temperature check outside in their car before they even come into the into the lobby. And so if there are no exposures, no symptoms, no temperature, they get brought right back into an exam room. They really bypass the lobby. So there are not a lot of um, people waiting in a room in a crowded setting. Literally, you go from your car to the, to the exam room. And then after that, you sit the exam room and you're on your way. So, yep, I think that's going to be standard for a while. Temperature checks and questionnaires before you even enter a building. So... Be prepared, folks. I'm telling you. <laughs> Dr. Leo, how you feeling? It's early where you are. So let the people know where you are and how you feel. I feel pretty good this morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Leo Moore. I'm an internal medicine and public health physician. I'm based in Los Angeles, California. I'm also a vlogger and I have recently launched a new online social media presence. It's called The Practical MD. Uh, I can be found at YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, uh, at The Practical MD. Uh, I'm feeling pretty well today. It's it's interesting to hear everyone talk about, um, you know, the screening that you had to go through in, in your clinic. Um, because I work in public health, one of the things that we've been doing is actually having uh, folks do drive-through testing. So they are getting tested, you know, in their cars, um, which, which we found has kind of made them feel more comfortable. They're not having to come into the clinic, at least for that, for that testing. Um, you know, and it, it allows us to kind of get them in and out and everyone feel as safe as possible. So, of course, um, that and we're doing some telemedicine as well. Um, but I can definitely see what Dr. Q is saying about having to sit at the computer for, you know, 10 hours a day. Because I tell you, if I'm not in a, a meeting, it's, you know, it's a phone call. If it's not a phone call, it's, you know, uh, something else is online related, writing documents, etc. So I, I do miss seeing and interacting with people as much as I used to, uh, both professionally and personally. Uh, but I'm happy to be here. Good morning. Thanks. Good morning to you. And we're happy to have you as well. So make sure you check him out as well on his information. So yes, let's just kick this off. I know recently, even this past week, there was a lot of information that came out um, about a supposed AIDS vaccine. We have spiking numbers with COVID-19. Um, going on. We know Black people are being <laughs> disproportionately affected by COVID-19 with everything that's out there, the, all the medical information. How do we know what to trust? Who do we know what to trust? There's so many questions that I have as somebody who's not in the public health profession uh, per se about where really can I get my information? So I just want to start there, first of all, when it comes to COVID-19 information or any other health information, what sources should we really be going to that is not Google? Because I ain't no doctor. So I just want to point it to you, Dr. Mel Branch. Where should we be going for our information and make sure we get everything correct? Um, I don't, there's tons of different sources of information, obviously, and all of them have their faults. Uh, I think, you know, it just depends on what you're looking for. I think cdc.gov actually is, is good for a lot of practical information uh, that you want to get. Um, I actually also look to a website called Stat News uh, that does a lot of articles, not only opinion pieces, but also reviews a lot of the recent articles that are coming out and gives kind of a fresh take on a lot of these things. And it's a whole slew of different healthcare and public health professionals that are good. Um, when it comes to HIV, I get a, I'm on an email listserv called I don't know the acronym, the acronym is N-A-T-A-P, um, but they send me like the hardcore scientific studies about HIV and a lot with COVID-19 recently. So 
I get my information from there. People talk about women WebMD a lot, and I can tell you just from my personal experience, and I'd love to hear what Q and Leo say about this, but all the time my patients come in and when they've gone on WebMD, they say, well, these were my symptoms. And when I went on WebMD, they said it was gonna be cancer. So that's why I'm here <laughs> and I'm worried that it's cancer. And so it's like every time someone goes to WebMD, for some reason, cancer is always listened in a differential. And it's it's happened so frequently with me over the course of the 15, 20 years that I've been practicing that I can't just chalk it off as like an anecdote here or there. Like there's something to this. And I know we have to include cancer as part of the different differential diagnosis of a lot of different things. But um, yeah, I just, it's funny, but I, it depends on what you're looking for. But those are some of the, the sites and some of the things that I use or I may send patients to. If it's HIV, I forgot to mention, pos.com, the body and the body pro.com are good, as well as TPAN, um, Treatment Positive Action Network, is good as well. So I'll just add on. I think, um, and I agree with you, David, that WebMD often leads people astray, uh, right? Because whatever the symptoms are that they have, um, it, it seems to kind of mirror and lead them straight to the worst possible diagnosis that it could be. So, so, you know, I just think oftentimes the person should come in and, or have a phone conversation with their provider, depending on, you know, uh, the limitations given COVID-19 uh, and share what their symptoms are and, and then come up with a treatment plan with their provider uh, rather than just going straight to, to online sources for when you need care for something. But if you're looking for COVID-19, information. I think one great place to look, and this depends on the depth of information you want. So I think, as you mentioned, cdc.gov is great. If you're looking for very up-to-date um, uh, research findings, you can also go to uh, Hopkins' website. Johns Hopkins mm. um, is doing a really, really good job um, you know, of cataloging and, and putting out um, information about COVID-19 uh, fast, late-breaking, if you will, research um, as well. Uh, so that's a great uh, source, I would say, for additional additional information about COVID-19. Uh, so it really depends on how deep you want to go and how uh, much information you want. I also know that Hopkins actually has a really good, um, a really good counter for um, how many COVID cases there are in a different state, in each state, in each county. They are doing a really, really good job of having those big GIS maps, if you will, and that have that, that information. And it's all based on what's being reported by those various health departments. So really good place for additional information. So I actually don't have much to add to those two, but I will say, you know, for general information, those are great places to go. I mean, the CDC you know, despite all of its current faults and issues, probably has the most up-to-date information for someone, at least for the lay public to un to understand. If you are a lay person who really wants to get into kind of the, the nuts and bolts of kind of where these things come from, and if you're like me, you're tired of looking at a screen and reading, um, the IDSA, the Infectious, Desi Infectious Diseases Society of America, actually has a COVID-19 podcast. So you wow. actually have, you know, infectious disease specialists just kind of talking in a general conversation about kind of what the most current issues around COVID-19 that week in terms of scientific publications or public health publications or even policy discussions that have come out and you just have a group of people and you just hear them talk about, you know, again, their, their take on it, whether it's, you know, an official recommendation, but you're still hearing, at least for me, trusted clinicians about what they think is important around COVID-19. And then um, I re re-engaged myself with the American College of Physicians. The ACP has done a fantastic job of collecting resources and putting out information both for the public and for clinicians about COVID-19. I think a couple of weeks ago, somewhat related but not directly related, they did in my opinion, the most amazing article on sexual health in COVID-19 that actually took it to a, a completely different level of what, you know, clinicians were, are in terms of discussion, sexual health and isolation in COVID-19. So I thought that was a really good place to kind of get some information about how do we engage with other people, whether on an intimate level or just a social level. So I thought that was a fantastic article that had come out. 
thank you. I appreciate you offer answering that question for me. Now, here's why I asked that first instead of last, because it seems like that would be the most logical thing to do. It's because I'm going to tell myself for a second. When it comes to medical mistrust, I, I don't trust doctors a lot of time. I don't. So even going into the dentist's office, and once they told me that I had to see an oral surgeon, I went straight to Google. I went straight to like the web MDs of all of these things to try to be like, what is a D, whatever that they called out, to try to put it together on my own. So I felt a little bit more protected of, of my of my health of walking in and not knowing anything of what this doctor might have told me. So even walking in and seeing that I had a black female doctor, I felt a little bit more at ease, but it was still so much like I was still on my guard of like, can I trust what ever is going to be the best course of action. So even with the story I told when she asked me, and I said it was a very beautiful thing, and she asked me, is this what you really want to do? Which kind of really engaged my trust a little bit. And I was like, okay, so she is looking out for my best interest here, which put me at ease. So I just kind of want to ask uh, you all individually within your practices, have you all experienced uh, medical mistrust and distrust within patients? And if you have, like, how do you kind of put them at ease and, and kind of I uh, bring them back to being, I don't want to say on your side, but bring them back to pretty much a little bit at ease. Yeah, I, I'll, I can start off. I think it's interesting. And I, I love hearing about your story because actually it's a very affirming story to me, what you're telling. And I think one of the points I would make is that we need to actually stop talking about the de the barriers and what makes people distrustful of physicians and medical spaces and figure out what the solutions are like what kind of behaviors or policies or systems actually in foster trust and engagement into medical spaces and of medical personnel um i'll also start off with you know kind of a, a blanket discussion or a definition of what mistrust versus distrust is and i even had to go back to look this up just to make sure because i've been screaming this for years but i wanted to make sure because someone tried to challenge me on it and i was like i know i'm not crazy but we use the word mistrust when you think about miss um as kind of that word just by itself if you miscalculate something, if you mislead somebody, if you misconstrue something, that's often denoting something is erroneous or something doesn't have a solid foundation or uh, it's not rooted in experience. It's just coming out of the blue. Whereas distrust speaks more of a distrusting based on a personal experience or on something that's factually happened or something that's factually there. And so it's almost like a more of a justified distrust. So I see a lot of people using mistrust, which makes me think, well, it's not mistrust, it's actually distrust, because when it comes to black people in accessing healthcare services, we have a lot of reasons to distrust the medical and public health professions. Um, and so I, I think it's one of those things where, you know, trusting folks and kind of what we do, for me personally in my practice, I could give you a million different examples of you know, where people came in and they were a little bit distrustful, and particularly with HIV, when we talk about HIV, and I know we'll get into the discussion of COVID-19, the vaccine, the potential treatments in a second. But with HIV, I do remember one patient in particular um, when I was working at the Ponce Clinic in Atlanta, who came in and his T cell count was like 50. And I needed to get him on his antiretroviral therapy and I needed to give him an antibiotic uh, to prevent against a certain type of pneumonia that happens with end stage HIV. Um, and AIDS called pneumocystis pneumonia. Um, and I remember he didn't want to start antiretroviral therapy because he didn't trust it. He didn't trust the medications. This was probably about 15 years ago. And so I had to actually make a, an exchange with him. And I said, well, you know, you don't have to start now. And I respect that. Um, I'm going to give you some information so you can look some things up and I'll follow up with you about that. But would you be able to take this one pill a day to prevent pneumonia? Because I'm really worried about that with you. And I remember he looked at me because it was kind of like a negotiation. And he was like, you know what? I can do that, doc. So I'll start taking that. And it was important for me not to try to shove the concept of him having to start medications right at that moment because he obviously wasn't ready and he could nod his head and be like sure doctor i'll take it and then he goes home and just puts it on the counter or never even fills out the prescription and so i felt it was important and so a lot of times i think as clinicians we have to juggle some of these things until they get to know us a little bit better and they'll say doc i know you're black i know you're gay but you also a doctor and I don't really trust the medical profession. Mm. And so we also have to realize that sometimes, um, you know, people will think um, skin folk ain't kin folk. And so whether it be in the police officer profession or the law enforcement profession or in the medical profession, you can't trust everybody until you kind of put them through 
a certain amount of tests to say, hey, yeah. can I trust you? And so I think he was just kind of feeling me out. And ultimately, we did get him on antiretroviral therapy, and he did very well. Um, but I remember he did take the the uh, antibiotic for one pill a day to prevent that pneumonia, and he never got it. So that's something that I do as an individual. But I'm sure Leo and, and Q can talk about some of the individual and the systemic things we can do. Yeah, I think, David, you hit on on one thing that I definitely wanted to say around around medical distrust, um, uh, particularly, you know, when we think about uh, the fact that um, so many, so many of us as black providers may think, oh, you know, because I'm black, the patient's automatically going to feel more comfortable with me. I've had experiences as well uh, where patients were not comfortable with me. And um, this one particular patient, I was trying to help him uh, to get a colonoscopy. Um, and, um, he felt that I was so much more focused on a colonoscopy than the thing that he'd actually come in for, you know? And so mm -hmm. because I was talking about both of those things, I wasn't talking enough about the thing that he wanted to focus on that day. Um, and that really turned him off and really made him uncomfortable. So we had mm -hmm. to work, you know, to get back to a point where we were even at a baseline to then build on that, you know, to, to establish a stronger relationship. So, you know, as you said, all skin folk aren't kin folk, and um, patients need time. They need to feel um, this level of, of comfort with you that, that can, you know, can take time to develop. And once it's there, then you're able to have a, a real authentic relationship. Um, the other thing I want to mention, Michael, is that you said informed consent is something that reminded me about com informed consent. Uh, and that was uh, when you were talking about how she asked you or she told you the risks and benefits um, mm -hmm. of, you know, your decision and making sure that you had spoken with all of the providers you needed to speak with. Uh, and then ultimately um, you chose or are choosing or in the process of choosing to get that tooth removed. Uh, and I think it's so important, you know, that we, <laughs> that we as providers <laughs> help <laughs> IP tooth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> RMP to my bank account. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's important that we as providers, you know, give the risks and benefits and, and then allow people to make the best decision for themselves and to take the time to answer the questions that, you know, are presented to us and not worry about the 15 minutes that we have for the visit or, you know, or that short amount of time. Because if we are rushing people to a decision, then we may be rushing them out the door to not, you know, take our recommendations or, or maybe it's to find someone else who will, they may have even worse outcomes with, you know? Um, and so I, I just think it's really important uh, that we keep those things in mind as, as providers. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Q. Yeah, so I think, you know, along the same lines as uh, Leo and, and David, but to your point when you talked about patients who, you know, consult Dr. Google or, you know, or talking about procedures and they go to YouTube and actually look at the procedure. Sometimes what I do, because I have the luxury of having about a half an hour to spend with the patient, I'll ask them, show me what you looked at. And then we'll go through it step by step. So you went to this website. So I'll tell you, at least in my opinion, you know, what's based in fact and what's kind of just a little bit of, you know, hyperbole just to make you scared. And then when it comes to YouTube videos, you know, some of those... Like I have a patient who needs a hip replacement. That's a, a very extensive surgery. And I kind of try to dissuade him from looking at that actual video of a hip replacement online. Cause it's pretty, it's, it's graphic. And you saw the video and he was like, yeah, I'm not doing that. He was like, there's nothing in the world. But I was like, you're asleep. You won't feel it. That's what they do all the time. But just having that little bit of extra information and so and it was one of those things where, OK, you looked at it. What's your concern about the surgery? Like what? You know, even though I'm not the surgeon, what can I do to convince you that this is probably the best mode of action? So if you sit down and take the time to figure out where a patient's coming from, like what are their fears based in? What are their concerns based in? What questions do they have? You know, affirm all of those concerns. Say, I understand where you're coming from. It makes sense. Let me explain to you why we're looking at it this way and kind of what that long-term option is, you know, versus, you know, chronic pain from needing a hip replacement versus, you know, a little bit of 
therapy and rehab after the surgery where you won't even remember that they pretty much dislocated your entire hip because mm -hmm. you won't feel it. But, you know, having seen that visual, it's stuck. So acknowledge it, you know, acknowledge, you know, and affirm what the patient's concern is and try to help them work through it. And it may not happen in that first visit. It may not happen in the second visit, but just continue to have that conversation. And then in the era of you know HIV and COVID-19, that's a whole other issue. I think COVID-19 makes it much more difficult because as physicians and clinicians and scientists and researchers, we're learning this as we're going. You know, we're learning these things as we're living through it. So I, you know, I have this conversation with friends all the time, you know, who aren't medical um, colleagues or in science. What we thought we knew about COVID-19 in January and February is completely different than what we know in June. So what we told you to do in January and February to protect yourself or in terms of what to expect may not be the case now and just have to understand that, you know, you know, this is a unique era because you're used to your doctor coming in and knowing what's going on. We're literally learning on the fly. And it's kind mm -hmm. of it is a little bit uncomfortable, even as a clinician, to say, you know what? I don't know. But I don't know is sometimes the safest thing you can tell to a patient. You know, yeah. I don't know, but I'll find out or I don't know and I'll try to find out and let them know that, hey, we're in this together. And I always describe my relationships with my patients as a partnership. Like, I don't make these decisions in a silo. I present the option to you and what your options are, and you tell me what you feel like doing, and we try to find a middle ground, except for in cases where I kind of know that this is, that, this is going to help. Like, that patient who has a CD4 count of two who was in the hospital with pneumonia yeah, we probably need to get you on antiretroviral therapy <laughs> probably yesterday, but it may not happen today, but I'm going to talk to you next week about it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's it's funny because that's why I didn't go into pediatrics, because in medical school, I felt so helpless with some of the kids because it was at the whim of their parents. And if their parents mm. didn't prioritize their health, then I, I knew my head would explode trying to fight bad parents to get a kid the treatment they deserved. And I think Q and um, Leo both said this brilliantly, but it's it's all about the difference between patient priorities and clinician priorities. And clinicians, we are sitting there and with these business concepts now, they're wanting us to cover all these things, all this stuff in every visit. A patient is coming in and saying, this is the shit I want you to deal with now. And this mm -hmm. is what's important to me. And we're sitting there in the back of our head because people are well, we're going to dock your pay or you're not going to get this or you're going to get a bad evaluation or you're going to get this if you don't hit these check boxes. And the we've lost focus of the patient is supposed to be the center of all this. And so when we rush people through and people are already coming in not trusting the medical profession and then they get a crappy experience because we're trying to push an agenda and they're like, well, you just focus on what I'm saying and what I'm trying mm -hmm. to tell you right now. Then they just turn away and they just bump it. And, you know, the amazing thing is that I've often recommended to patients, I said, look, don't let the medical profession get you down or convince you that your health isn't important. So if you have something going on and the doctor treats you like crap or the nurse practitioner or the PA or the nurse or the phlebotomist or wherever's in the system treats you like crap, if you say, well, I'll show you, I'm not going to you anymore, and then you mm -hmm. go home, that provider, that healthcare worker goes home and do you think they're going to lose any sleep? They're not going to lose any sleep because it's not their problem. You're hurting yourself at that point because it's your foot. So, But it's yeah. hard to get people empowered to that point to say, hey, you know, you need to fight for it. And, and you need to fight for it. And you need to stop them and say, you know, look, you need to stop whatever you're doing. Stop whatever your agenda you have and go ahead and pay attention to what I'm telling you is my top priority right now. Um, because when you go home, you're still going to be left with that ailment that didn't get addressed uh, but now you'll be even more pissed off mood about it, um, but it still won't get addressed. So you, it, it's hard because some people will shoot themselves in the foot to say, look, I'm not going to go here because I don't feel comfortable. And it's definitely justifiable. And I think we, we need to recognize that. And people have been saying, you know, why do people believe in conspiracy theories or why do people distrust doctors? And I was like, why don't we just all shut up and listen to what people have to say and what their experiences mm -hmm. are, acknowledge and affirm that, and then we can have an open discussion. Well, I'd like to add to that um, because I think it's also really important that uh, patients know and that people know that you can always change your provider. 
So depending on your health insurance, how often you can change your provider, you'll have to call, but you can change your provider and finding the right provider is, you know, like finding the right partner, or some people might say finding the right pair of shoes. You've got to find that right fit, that person that you feel comfortable with, that person that explains things to the level that you need, that person that truly, you know, engages you in the decision-making process. All the things that we're talking about, you've got to find that right provider and not give up, you know. So, so I think um, really uh, encouraging people to utilize their, their health care plans to, to the max that they can, you know, if you will, to the max benefit that they can for them, um, which mm -hmm. includes finding the right provider. And even if they don't have insurance, if they're at a, you know, a safety net hospital or clinic, just because if you don't have insurance or they're providing insurance to the uninsured or you have Medicaid or Medicare, doesn't mean that you don't get a choice if you have a bad experience with provider, ask for something different. Don't think, well, I should just be lucky that I'm getting healthcare at all. No, that's not the point at all. You should be, they should be lucky that you're coming to them, um, helping pay their salaries. So you get to choose in that respect. So that's that's tremendously important. Mm -hmm. Thank y'all. Oh, I'm sorry, I want to cut you off, go ahead. I was gonna say, just to add to that in terms of kind of talking about medical mistrust and distrust, one of the things that I, you know, learned in residency, one of my attendings told me, if you, as the physician, sit and shut up and just listen to your patients, they'll tell you exactly what's wrong. And I think, you know, to the point that David was making, all these other people who are involved in patient care, you know, now there's, it's not just the patient and the doctor in the exam room, it's the patient, the doctor, the insurance company, the pharmacy, all those are the people that are in the exam room. And the doctor's trying to listen to all of those, but if you really just stop and listen to the patient, you'll find out everything that's wrong with them and you can come up with a plan to help them understand the healthcare system. Amen. So I think to those who are listening, you know, who work in the healthcare setting or even to people who don't, when you go to your, your to any healthcare setting, make sure that they're listening to you. Mm. And if yes. not, make them listen to you. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. And I was going to say that I love I love this because even even being in that chair with the light shining in my face and being able to feel empowered and have those conversations with the doctor and being able to use my voice was it was just a new feeling for me. Like that was kind of my first time of really, like I said, having a black female doctor, but feeling empowered to be able to use my voice in a, in a doctor setting. So I love all, everything that you all are saying, and I hope people really take that to heart and walk away with it and they feel empowered to, to make that decision. This conversation was so good, y'all. We had to give y'all a part two. So make sure you come back for the next episode of Revolutionary Health. As always, like, subscribe, follow, comment, find us on all our social media, Facebook, Instagram at The Counter Narrative, Twitter, we're at Building Desire. As always, be good to yourself.